Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 88. 88, so close to 90. Yes, crazy 88. Is that a thing? Yeah, from Kill Bill. Uh, It wasn't a good reference. Okay, well, it was very impressive I'm clutching at straws. 88. (laughs) I thought, is that a a bingo thing? Is that what's that from? I don't know. Uh, Two Fat Ladies. Two Fat Ladies. There you go, there you go. Two Fat Ladies and the Crazy 88s fight. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be an interesting scene. One of the outtakes from Kill Bill. (laughs) Ah, how are you, Nick? Oh, yeah, but I can't complain. Bumbling along, you know. Your boiler started really tapping there a minute ago. Well, is it going to explode? That's the least of it. That's This is positively quiet for this oh boiler. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> is this how we die? Just in a tragic blo- well, boiler explosion? Well, it's been on the verge of explosion for about three years, so... <laughs> could go any time. Could, okay. go, could be tomorrow, could be now, could be in six years. I wonder if there's one listener out there who just only listens to hear if the boiler does explode. And every week they're disappointed. I find that unlikely. Quite niche. Well, any poisonings this week, Nick? No, no. No poisonings for November? Is it a bad thing? Well, I'm sure I wouldn't know, Nick. You tell me <laughs> of your poisoning ways. Everyone is safe. For now. For now. For now. The Always little... add that little caveat at the end. For now. The little black book of poisonings can go back into the drawer. with it a... Back on the shelf. And Nick is tucking into his pre-cocktail cocktail, of course. It is the way of things. What are you drinking? I, have... I haven't had one for ages. And I fancied it with a bit of green. <laughs> Which I knew Sinead would hate. Ugh. So I've made myself a last word. Oh, a last word. You yeah, do love a last word. I do word. love a last word. It's been a while. and had some limes just lying around the place. I have a lot of limes so at home. So I thought they need a squidging. Saucy. I like it. <laughs> so I made myself a last word. Well, speaking of having the last word and squidging things, <laughs> I think it's time for us to thank our lovely, delicious new Patreon subscribers. Indeed. Um, there's a splendid, splendidly named person this week. Thank you so much to Christine Macher. Christine Macher? Oh, That's my darling Christine. Oh, what a marvellous, marvellous name. Very, very good. I like that. I like that a lot. So thank Thank you very much for joining us and I hope you're finding lots of Patreon treats. And thank you to all of our resubscribers. We've had people rejoin us on Patreon every month. We always say, dip in, see how you feel. We understand that people can't always commit long term. They might want to come back in. And then they realise they cannot live without the poisonous cabinet in their lives. And they come back. They always come crawling (laughs) back and we take them back. We welcome you with open arms. So thank you to all of our delicious, very, very sexy Patreon subscribers. We also have a little shout out this week. Mm-hmm. Very special one to a very, very special listener to Cooper Gunn. Hello there, Mr. Cooper. Cooper, we know you listen. Cooper is but five years old. Don't everyone panic at the fact that a five-year-old <laughs> listens to this show. Mother Kristen <laughs> is a loyal fan of the show and she and Cooper listen every week. She pre-screens, don't worry. <laughs> Little Cooper loves to listen to the show and every time Nick introduces himself, Cooper has an uncle also named Nick and he goes, that's not Uncle Nick. No, it's not Uncle it's Nick. It's not, I'm not Uncle Nick. It's not Uncle Nick in disguise, Cooper. <laughs> but we love you. We are so glad that you listen to the show and we're glad that you find it fun. So thank you, Cooper. Hello. Well, Nick, mm. are you ready <gasps> to drink cocktails and talk about poison? Mm. Or, or, mm. or, 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 we could drink poison. I mean, or we could talk about cocktails. I want a story. Tell me a story. Oh, should we go with the first one? Yes. Okay, let's go with the first one. It's my story this week. Hooray, hooray, hooray. But as we've established, we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have any stories in this house without a cocktail in hand. Or indeed in your houses. Yeah, absolutely not. Or anywhere you're listening to this. If you're walking down the street, you better goddamn you have a cocktail have in a hand. have a cocktail, absolutely. If you're in work, put the cocktail in a thermos. Who's to know? Who no one would ever know. Starbucks, is it gin? Who's to say? There you go. Except when you're called in by HR for being <laughs> outrageously drunk at your desk. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell and will flavour our cocktail of the week. My story this week, so my pick. Mm. And this week's secret ingredient, Nick, is mm. soap. Yes. Soap. I, I do feel this is revenge for last <laughs> week. <laughs> Would I? How bitterly furious you were with my ingredient last week. I do feel this is some sort of payback. 
I mean, whatever payback I have, it's hollow because I've got to drink this the is, bloody this is, thing this is very too. True. This is very true. So you're only making yourself suffer. Exactly. Well, I did have a second ingredient, which I shall reveal during the story. Never. Um, and Nick absolutely point blank refuses to have this. <laughs> and one day I'm going to have to give him no alternatives. I foolishly gave him an alternative, which was soap. But we'll all see how people feel about this later. But soap. Wash your mouth out, Nick. Indeed. From your talk of chartreuse. <laughs> May as well just put chartreuse in it. So. With soap as the ingredient. Yes. Inspiration. Or let's, let's, let's go with inspiration on this oh, occasion. Thank the good yes, Lord. Let's go with inspiration. What have you come up with? Well, I mean, there were a few options. Yeah, I'm, I'm always intrigued when I throw a curveball at you and you just immediately what? go, yes. <laughs> so it does depend on how you interpret soap. <laughs> I'm going to interpret it one way as in soap. What but, are you doing with well, no, soap? We could have, we could have had, a, had a fat wash drink. Because the soap is basically fat and a alkaloid to make it cleany. Yeah. So it could, have, could have gone down that. Oh, I'm going chemically on you. It would have been a stretch, but I'm sensing you didn't do that. But I didn't do how that. How quickly you that. did this. <laughs> I did do that. There wasn't that. Going for a slightly more literal interpretation. So where do you think you would find some soap? <laughs> where would you find some lovely soap? Where would I find lovely soap? Yes. In, a, in a bathroom? Okay, think somewhere else. In a kitchen? Mm. In a laundry? We are having a wash house. A wash house. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can get it. You've got a wash house for laundry, but also laundry, to go and wash but, yourself. Pretend, yes, well, indeed, yes. Multiple methods of washing. <laughs> is it your laundry? Is it yourself? Is it your... Is it your other things? No, that's it. That's it. There's two, isn't it? There's laundry and yourself and maybe some ornaments when they get dusty. You take them to the wash house. I take my dusty <laughs> ornaments to the wash house. I do. <laughs> Are you not supposed to do that? <laughs> How else will you do it? Some sort of dusting mechanism. Oh, That's goodness. insane. Some sort of crazy thing. <laughs> Everyone's got some old wives tale or something that their relative has done, an old relative about where they used to wash things that didn't need washing at all. Let's wash this designer jacket in, in bleach <laughs> that your grandmother did. And you're like, oh, thank you so much. This yes. is great. A wash yeah. house. I, I, I don't know. Is it going to be soapy and foamy? We'll find out, won't we? Full of bristles. Full of bristles. Full of loofah. Full of loofah, <laughs> indeed. So that's how, I'm, that's how I'm juicing my limes with a mangle this week. <laughs> <laughs> you bloody love that, wouldn't you? <laughs> that would be great fun. I remember my, my grandmother had Here a mangle. Here it comes. Here it comes. There we in go. Her, in she her had, kitchen. How, what? What in the what? How did she? How did she? How did she? Because she was quite old-fashioned. And she had a mangle. So what do you use a mangle for? Just to ring, Just to, ring out Yeah, to ring clothes. out stuff. So put your wet things in and you squidge it around and you get dry. Well drier things out less water <laughs> yeah Slightly no less it, it just came into my head I'm, yeah. did she use it or did she yeah. just have it there no she used or it was it to punish you potentially yes put your hands in there <laughs> you've been a bad child oh god <laughs> this is dark that's why I'm so tall <laughs> Okay, you see, everyone always has a weird washerwoman story from their family. Right in with yours, people. Okay, before this gets more delving into Nick's psyche, I think it's time for us to head into the Poisoner's Cabinet Kitchen and shake up a storm, so we'll see you in a minute. See you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. Well, it's green. What, what is it? It is, the, oh, it is the most beautifulest green in the world. This is the greenest thing I've ever seen. It is the veriest greenest thing. Can it be a cocktail made from purest green? Purest green. green. <laughs> yes, this is a very, very green cocktail. I don't yes. think I was expecting that from the wash house. Ah. Or, I don't know what I was expecting, a to be honest. A wash house. A curious garnish. The garnishes are getting ever and more curiouser <laughs> each week. Do I detect a little leaf of basil little on the top? Little basil leaf on the top. Oh, my God. Now, I love a bit of basil. Love a bit of basil, me. I guess basil can taste a bit soapy. Can it? But also, it's very nice in a pesto. <laughs> oh, is there pesto in it? There's pesto. It's a pesto cocktail. Pesto. Pesto. No, I could just not. eat pesto with a spoon. I'm very hungry. I haven't had dinner. We're, so. not, we're not doing that. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I've ever had a cocktail with basil in it or whether you've just put this in there to confuse Well, perhaps me. I've just put that in there to take your mind off the green. Oh, God. Is it? You wouldn't. You wouldn't do that to me, Nick. <laughs> Not after everything we've been through. <laughs> oh, God. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, well, with the greenness that could the green. that could kill me. A little sniff for Stephen's drink. Ooh, it smells um, interesting. Soapy, actually. <laughs> what? <laughs> I think I've got it in my mind. All right, Merry Christmas. Yep, Merry Christmas. Um, oh, um, uh, uh. Ooh. Ooh, oh, there's the basil. <laughs> Oh, but that's a nice oh, aftertaste. Nice. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't sure what the start of that was. Very sharp. 
And then it gives way to a lovely basily finish, like a pesto. <laughs> That is actually surprisingly nice. Yeah. I'm very pleasantly surprised by that. Mm. Yeah, it's, there's a lot going on there. Huh? There's a lot of layers to there's it. A lot of layers. You've got to just stay silent while you're. Uh, uh, oh, and there's, oh, there's that. More. There's, there's that. another one there. Then. <laughs> it feels very summery as a drink. Mm, that's good. I oh, like. No, that's good. Oh I'm yeah. Oh, I'm pleasantly really surprised. I am loving that basil flavour. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I could almost be eating a big bowl of pasta. Right now. <laughs> oh, Nick, what is in this? So it's actually incredibly simple. But four ingredients. <laughs> so yes, we have some basil. Wait. We have some basil that has been a muddled. A muddled. And then a shaken with the booze to release its <laughs> basiliness. Its basily oils. But we have vodka. There's a base hey, of vodka. Okay, vodka. We don't often have a no, vodka we don't. cocktail. It is vodka, lime juice, bit of sugar, shaken with some basil. That's it? That's it. Wow. Well, you have to like basil. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that, fortunately you do. So that works. But yeah, no, I'm actually, I was a bit hesitant, so I wasn't sure which way this would go. It actually works out really well. That's, ah, that's surprisingly really good. good. It's very well, clean and... Yeah. Yeah. Fresh, lovely. Ooh, yeah, very good. A little taste of summer from yes. the depths of winter. Depths of November. <laughs> <laughs> Why the wash house, though? Why was that uh, name come from? It came from the wash house because it was slightly cheating. The, the bar that developed this was based in a former laundry. Oh, um, so they named right, it after okay. the premises rather than anything to do with the drink oh, itself. It's crowbarring uh, so that crowbar in there. So crowbar in there because, yeah, the the premises was a, a laundry in the olden times. But Where just, is the wash house? I believe it's there, somewhere in the States. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if it was just an old wash house that literally was just somewhere out back and someone in there just decided to create <laughs> the best cocktail bar ever? Well, they've done it. No one ever came. They were like, this is infused with basil. Mm. <laughs> Delicious. Delicious. Well, with the wash house mm. firmly in hand, deliciousness... Are you ready for a story? Yeah. Hooray! I think so. Well, we are in the wash house. Hmm. I don't know if that's given you any hints to soap and wash house of the kind of story we could be telling. Someone who required a damn good scrubbing. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone who was boiled alive in a big vat of soap. No, no. but let's come back to that one. Death, death by laundry. <laughs> death by laundry. They fell into a washing <laughs> machine. Fell into a big old it. vat of laundry. Well, it is 1915, and our old friend, pathologist. Bernard Spilsbury. Oh, good for him. We well, you know Bernard very good well. Old Bernard. Well, he is pondering. What's he pondering? Oh, with a, with a wash house in hand. Indeed. And a pipe. No, he is pondering. He's pondering how three sweet, innocent, newly wed women could have drowned. Mm. Literally, how did they drown? By going under the water. You would think. <gasps> For he is faced with what had first seemed a series of unfortunate events, but it turned out to be the handiwork of a true Svengali. Of, of Lemony Snicket. <laughs> <laughs> no, but today we are going to tell the story of the brides in the bath. Oh, very good. Do you know the story? I know of the story. It's no, one of my ones it. on the list. Ah, to not research, anymore. <laughs> but no, not anymore, but I have done nothing with it. Excellent. So, exciting times. Now, it was curious, actually, how I came across this story, mm. uh, which I shall reveal in, in due course. But the story of the Brides of Bath in the bath, not of bath. <laughs> brides of bath. And we do go to bath <laughs> at one point. It gets very confusing. <laughs> But it all centres around George Joseph Smith. If you were to look up Victorian villain in the dictionary, his face might appear. Nice. Next to a picture of Dr. Thomas Cream. We're talking big old moustache, piercing moustache, eyes. Top hat. And sometimes there's a top hat, sometimes. Strange hand. Yes. <laughs> Just standing on railway tracks waiting for women. Excellent. But keep that um, image of him in mind. George Joseph Smith was born in Bethnal Green in 1872. And he managed to get to the age of nine before starting to commit crimes. Oh, well, well done him. Yeah, his first crime he was caught stealing, uh, called thieving at the time. He was convicted of thieving. Such thievery. He was sent to a reformatory school in Gravesend. Oh, oh Kent. poor him. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You're better off in Bethnal Green, mate. <laughs> 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 Much safer. He would be back in jail again in his teens for swindling and more theft. More theft. He liked a bit of theft. But his spell inside did nothing to change his ways or persuade him to turn towards a more honest way of life. No, George seemed to have a talent with the ladies. Oh. And an even greater talent for persuading people to part with their money. <laughs> well, he thought, why not combine the two? Convince people to part with their ladies. Yes. <laughs> 
not mash the two sentences together. <laughs> ah, boo. Employ both skills at once. Oh, okay, fine. Be a devil with the ladies I and a devil you, with their purse. I think my way would be much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is quite good, actually. That's more of a Lothario. <laughs> In 1896, he convinced a young lady who he was probably seeing or he had perhaps just a beguiling effect on her, convinced her to steal money from her employers. Mm. He apparently used the money to open a bakery in Leicester. But so not he's... a small amount of money then? No, no. Not oh, just no. go and nick a fiver. This is go and nick enough for me to buy a shop. Not at all. Yeah, he was able to buy a shop. He did end up in jail for the best part of the year for his troubles. But his early escapades show the the scale of his ambition. He is only too happy to get women to do his dirty work. At first, he starts targeting women who are in employment and say, go and steal from your employers and bring it back to me. And I love you and we'll be together forever. And he gets a lot of cash out of people. The sums all the way through this story are not insubstantial Mm -hmm. at all. This is a real case of greed the greatest poison of them all now he's back in jail he's stolen from this woman's employer indirectly he's back in jail surely surely now he should change his thieving ways nope he's just got to get a better system exactly a short time after his release he met 19 year old bootmaker she was at the time named caroline beatrice thornhill and he decided by then that he needed an alias if he was going to keep courting women for his own financial gain Mm, his spells in prison maybe his name would get around Around. Yeah, he's got a reputation and things. Mm. So. He does move around the country quite a bit. He's mm. quite clever in that sense. But he introduces himself to her, but wanting to be a prospective mate for her as George Love. First name that came into his head, obviously. Prospective mate? Have we gone into the sort of Attenborough documentary Yes, now? it was the first thing I could think of. <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Suitor. <laughs> Presenting himself as a prospective suitor. Prospective mate. <laughs> I know. They were seen thinking. shagging in the park. <laughs> Well, he could have chosen any other name apart from Love, couldn't he? I'm Mr. Love. I love you. Or George Copperfield. Grabby boobs. <laughs> George. Yeah, George Grabby boobs is going to be <laughs> is, is going to be less subtle. But Caroline was smitten. Love or Grabby boobs aside, and the two were wed. This would be George's only legal marriage because it is his first one. Right. Okay. All the rest of them. None of nonsense. <laughs> Very much so. Nick. Very much so. They moved down to London where Caroline took a job as a maid and George dusted off his powers of persuasion once again and quietly convinced her to start stealing from her employers for his benefit. Of the spoons. The shiny spoons. The shiny silver spoons. The tiny, tiny spoons for the mustard. <laughs> or just the great wads of cash. Now, she did what she was told, but she was caught for her trouble and she spent several months in jail in Worthing. A wife being in jail shouldn't stop a man with so much love to give. He <laughs> pays no heed to his marriage vows. George marries another woman and sets about finding ways to have her make money for him uh, as well. Got to get his income somehow. Can't be expected to work for his money. He is someone who very much believes in bigamy. <laughs> He hits a small snag, actually, at this point, when Caroline gets out of jail and immediately implicates him in a load of thefts. And he has to go to jail for a while. Bitter, bitter ex-wife going, well, okay, fine, you're going to go to jail. So he goes inside for for quite a while. Some reports say it's about two years. Again, does nothing to dissuade him from his chosen career as a bastard, apparently. (laughs) When he's released, Caroline, his first legal wife, flees to Canada. But his other wife is waiting for him. He's only too happy to return to her, steal her savings, and then run away. George spends the next few years flexing his charm all over the southeast coast and sometimes into the Midlands. It's remarked that there are plenty of single young women at the time. So we're into the 1900, the zeros. What do we call that? The noughties. The noughties. The 1990s. The 1990s. The the (laughs) noughties. <laughs> it was said, obviously, a lot of men are emigrating to the colonies at the time, and there were newspaper reports that uh, there were far more single women because a lot of the men were going off to try and find work and new lives, and they're like, who will love me? Who will wed me? Oh, no. So love is what they want. Love is what they've got. George worked his way through multiple courtships and multiple marriages Mm -hmm. turning on the charm promising his sweethearts the earth and then running off with their money or their valuables or possessions as soon as he could get his hands on them he wed florence wilson in june 1908 but by july he had run off with 30 pounds of her cash that's the equivalent of three thousand pounds today that's a considerable sum Mm. he also sold all her things in london then there was edith pegler who he wed and would leave alone on long travels he would go away and return with wads of cash from mysterious sources and she business Business trips trips. business trips took what little she had as well he then married sarah freeman in 1909 he stole her war bonds (laughs) the cash 
had. How rude. Woman after woman. The power he had over women. How does he do it, though? How does he do it? He is noted, Nick, Hmm. very important, for wearing brightly coloured bow ties. I mean, that'll do it, to be honest. That would get you. Yeah, gotcha. (laughs) Bring it on, moustache and a bow tie. Is he making some bow tie twirl? (laughs) (laughs) Fancy jewellery he wears as well. But it was his eyes. Witnesses later said that held his true power. One quote from a woman who knew him in his early days said, when he looked at you, you had the feeling that you were being magnetised. They were little eyes that seemed to rob you of your will. Mm-hmm. These grey eyes. So look into my eyes. Look into my eyes. Not around my eyes. But look into my eyes. <laughs> Hold on to that thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there with a pocket watch. <laughs> well, you've mentioned it. Um, <laughs> there okay. <laughs> would be many a rumour, and I will come back to this later. <laughs> that was George a hypnotist. Ooh. <laughs> which I love for a that's, good that's Victorian great. story I mean absolutely yeah <laughs> creeping along the <laughs> south coast just with big bo- swirly eyes and the big spirals <laughs> and, his, and his bow tie going round as well bow tie going round a pocket watch no one stood a chance <laughs> <laughs> and it is but now we come to 1910 mm-hmm. George has obviously worked his way through many a woman stealing their goods running away getting away with it but now he has started walking out with Bessie Mundy A fairly plain but well-off young woman that he has met in Bristol. She has a fortune of two and a half thousand pounds. That's a lot of cash. Yep, 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 yep. She knows George as Henry Williams. Uh Uh-huh. Picture restorer extraordinaire. (laughs) I added the extraordinaire bit. Okay, right, okay. Picture restorer to the gentry. (laughs) (laughs) They are married just a few weeks after meeting and they move to the beautiful seaside town of... Hearn Bay. Oh, God. <laughs> it's not that beautiful anymore. <laughs> now, Hearn Bay is literally down the road from where me and Nick live. It is in Kent. <laughs> I found this story. I had not heard of this until very recently when I was literally for work researching facts about Hearn Bay. Oh, nice. And his name came up. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm like, don't think I'm going to put that on their tourism website. Yeah. No sooner had they settled into their coastal cottage that Henry, George, insists, insists that the couple must sort out their paperwork. Quite right. Newly words they need to sort out their paperwork. Bessie, she really needs to make out a will, naming him as her complete benefactor. First thing you do when you get married. Yeah, absolutely. Up until now, George has only been stealing, but a will? This does not bode well for his new bride. No sooner has she made up the will, than George goes off to the local ironmonger to ask him what the price would be for a large cast iron bath. Oh. Two pounds, he's told. Two pounds? Mm-hmm. Okay. A couple of days later, Bessie goes back to the same ironmonger, mm. having been instructed by her husband to buy the bath, but he insists that she must get a two-shilling discount. <laughs> okay. Two pounds, <laughs> naked profiteering. <laughs> <laughs> How is she meant to acquire this two-shilling discount? I think he's given her the money, but she has to haggle. He makes her haggle right. with the ironmonger, says, I'll buy it, but for this much. Makes Fair her enough. do the dirty work. So mm. she buys the bath. I don't think he makes her drag it home. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Then George springs some terrible news on his wife. She has been suffering from epileptic fits. She just doesn't know it. Oh, right. Okay. So she's not entirely aware of these. Okay. Of course not. Of course not. She's been having fits and she just can't remember any of them. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, no, I haven't. Like, no, No. you have. (laughs) Don't remember. We need to go to the doctor immediately. We need to go to the doctor. Shoves Bessie through the door of the doctor. Bessie dimly goes along and repeats what her husband has told oh, her. Dear. She, she. Well, would you doubt it? If someone has said epilepsy, as you do, there is a memory loss aspect of it. I mean, this person you've just married, you're deep head over heels in love with. Would you? Mm. You would trust them, surely. Generally, yes, you would trust them. Yeah. After he has made you write out your will and then forced you to go and buy a giant bath what's and the then is shoving you do through the door the, of the what's doctors. What's the, the giant bath got to do with anything at this point? It's a bit weird. Perhaps she liked a bath. So you want a bath? Here's the money. Go and buy yourself a bath. <laughs> go and buy yourself a bath, darling. Luxury. Yeah. He's treating his woman so fine. Precisely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, yes, she's at the doctor's saying, I'm suffering from epilepsy. The doctor listens to her. She's confirming her symptoms. He he checks her. She says she's definitely been having headaches. So he gives her tablets for the headaches and they leave. While they're staying in Herne Bay, George pesters the doctor again, saying that his wife is at home having a fit. He calls him. She's fine. Mm. The doctor calls round and checks her and is like, okay, she seems to be okay. She's, she's on a medication. No problem. And on the 13th of July, the doctor receives another message from George, or Henry, as his name is there, saying, come at once. My wife has died. Oh. She's drowned. Oh. 
Sure enough, the doctor arrives and finds Bessie in the bath. Her head is submerged, her legs are sticking out straight and her feet are out of the water. It looks like a bizarre case of drowning. Now, you might all be going, oh, really, don't be so stupid. Of course he bloody (laughs) murdered her and he drowned her and he pushed her under the water. Any doctor could see that. Even the incompetent ones could see this. Open and shut case. There's no evidence of a struggle. Yeah. No bruising. There are no marks on the body. Nothing to suggest this woman has been forced underwater or held there forcibly. Whatever state you're in, it takes a lot to drown someone. Yeah, absolutely. They're gonna, people are going to struggle whether they're having a fit or whatever. They're going to struggle and fight back. And there would be <laughs> evidence of it, but there is none. Mm. The only curious thing is that Bessie is gripping in her hand a bar of soap. <laughs> okay. There is the soap. There's the soap. Ah, the soap. And we'll come back into play later. I should hope so. The doctor, a little bemused, has no choice but to attribute her death to drowning due to epilepsy. Mm. That she has had a fit and she has drowned as a result of it. There was an inquest. They return the same verdict. And George Smith, Henry Williams, walks away with £2,579. Mm-hmm. That's over a quarter of a million pounds in today's money. Yeah, that's a considerable amount of cash. That was what was put in her will that she made five days before she died. <sighs> that's going to be suspicious. More suspicious in hindsight. Yes, indeed. George gives Bessie the cheapest coffin he could find. <laughs> He buries her in a commoner's grave. Oh, dear. Not even a private plot. Just chucks her into the ground after taking all of her money. And he also returns the bath for a refund. Oh, God. Now, that's that's harsh. (laughs) And also, the the blacksmith's going, someone died in this bath. (laughs) Resale value is a lot less. (laughs) We'll use it to make gin. (laughs) So, you'd think this would be enough for George. Um. You would think that a good quarter of a million in today's money would be enough. If this podcast has taught us nothing, it's that no! Absolutely not. I think that'll probably keep you going for a couple of years, maybe. Maybe three? Maybe three years. Three years. Yeah. Three years later, George is in South Sea, and he is engaged to wed Alice Burnham. She is described as plump and pretty. Nice. <laughs> Alice's father has doubts, it's said, about this son-in-law. He's not entirely happy about this. Oh. And there's a quote saying, describing him during the engagement as being a very evil appearance. <laughs> it's just there twirling the stuff constantly. <laughs> <laughs> the, all of the reports about what George uh, I want to see Smith... a picture of this man. Do you want me to show you a picture? Oh, I'm intrigued. Okay, hang on a second. So you've seen the picture now, Nick. It's very, very villainous. It indeed. is, isn't it's it? It's very, very good. Yeah. And also, I do have to point out, during that pause, Sinead <laughs> wanted to get another drink because she had knocked back to her wash house and decided to get a nice gin and tonic. Couldn't be asked to go to the cabinet with the glasses, so put it in a mug. So now yep. she's now sitting here recording with a mug of gin and tonic. Even that she is. What I also did was I got the cocktail shaker that you left out there that had the ice in it that still had some basil in it and just put that in by hand as well <laughs> couldn't, even, ice. couldn't even go to the freezer to get fresh ice i uh, sensed we had a priority to record have, have i taught you nothing over the, these two years we've been doing this uh, <laughs> have you learned nothing no. from the weekly cocktails that have been had <laughs> wow i'm going to be getting a lecture yes, after this absolutely <laughs> Back to the story, Nick. So we can we can agree he's very evil in appearance. Most definitely. Probably finger pyramiding of evil <laughs> contemplation the whole way through. But regardless of Alice's father's concerns, the pair of them wed on the 4th of November. On the same day, Nick, mm. he takes her to a doctor to get a certificate to ensure that she is healthy enough to have a £500 life insurance policy in her name. Well, be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. I mean, th- that poor girl, what was she imagining she was being whisked off to on her wedding day? Well, I mean, the, the doctor's surgery was next to the registry office. <laughs> it makes sense. It's just convenient. Two birds with one stone. Are we going to lunch and to watch the sunset with champagne? Right, let me just tech you, check you down and see if you're healthy <laughs> just enough. just have a medical first. Wedding night? No. Ew. <laughs> None of that. None of that. It I is to not tend b- to my moustache. <laughs> But he does treat her to a lovely, slightly belated honeymoon in Blackpool. Now, at the time, Blackpool. Oh, oh very fancy. Oh, yeah. oh, I have never been to Blackpool. Neither have I. We should go. No, it's, 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 far, it's far, far north. 
I'm never going to be that far north. <laughs> Monsters up there. Now, on this honeymoon that they take to Blackpool, there mm. is a scene that certain listeners will understand. It is straight out of a certain Simpsons episode. And I want you to guess in the comments of this episode. <laughs> when they check into the first boarding house, he refuses to stay here because he demands that they must leave because the room doesn't have a private bathroom with a bath. Okay. Not good enough for my Not wife. Good. Absolutely. No, another wife who likes a bath. Yeah. Who doesn't like a bath? He was simply looking out for his new bride. He knows she likes a bath of an evening. Making sure she has a bath. I believe That's you. love. They find a suitable accommodation good. soon with the biggest bath known to humanity. As soon as they have checked in. What does a man do with his wife on when they've checked into their honeymoon? <laughs> he takes her straight to the doctor saying she's been having headaches. <laughs> it's very possible that this was true. Alice may have become suddenly ill. Why? we don't know three days after they have arrived at this boarding house the landlady is in the kitchen doing her chores and she notices drops of water coming from the ceiling at the same time george smith suddenly appears and starts talking very animatedly at the landlady probably along the lines of look at me i'm here i'm standing here in this room i'm definitely nowhere else here's my name and the time that i have arrived in this room <laughs> standing there with a newspaper with that date on it <laughs> if you got it if you got it if you got it take a mental picture great i'm just going to go upstairs now. oh my god my wife is dead in the bath <laughs> The wife is dead in the bath. The landlady sees as well. The doctors are called. They investigate. Again, no signs of struggle. No bruising. Nothing. This time, the inquest, which is called and convened, mm-hmm. determines that she has died from drowning after fainting. I'm never going to have a bath again. It's dangerous. Next, we move on to Margaret Lofty. Lofty. Lofty Marge. Lofty Marge. <laughs> This time, George goes by the name of John Lloyd. He is a wealthy land agent. Oh, he has prospects. And he meets his future bride in Bath. Excellent. Not in the Bath, Bath. He laughs constantly through their first meeting. It's hilarious. He said, you have no idea how ironic (laughs) this is, but it'll become clear later. (laughs) But December 1914, they have wed. And she also now has a life insurance Mm. in her name of £700. Mm where her husband is the only beneficiary. They honeymoon Nick in Highgate. Oh. And on their wedding night, George takes his bride straight to the doctor saying she has a headache. <laughs> doctor gets up and stops laughing. Headache on your honeymoon. <laughs> nudge, nudge, wink, wink. <laughs> Gives her some medication. Just everybody registered that she had headaches and was a bit faint. Next night, the landlady of the lodgings, she's downstairs, she's ironing, and she can hear from the room that the Lloyds, in inverted commas, have rented. They're playing the hymn, Nearer My God to Thee. I mean, classic honeymoon, honeymoon affair. <laughs> well, you, you're going to get it on to the hymn, aren't you? <laughs> Nothing really puts you in the mood than the last song that was played on the Titanic, Titanic while it was sinking. <laughs> oh, this really gets me going. She's listening. She's a nosy old landlady. <laughs> she's got her ear to the ceiling. Like, oh. Yeah. So she's ironing. Then she hears the front door slam. Then she hears the doorbell ring immediately afterwards. And she opens and uh, John Lloyd, George, is standing there going, I had to go out and get my wife some tomatoes. But I forgot my key. Can you let me in again? No, they also forgot the tomatoes. (laughs) Tomatoes for her dinner. That could have been the secret ingredient, people. Could have been. What would have happened? But then you would have made me make a Bloody Mary. I would no, have made you something no, special. No, I, I have a, I have an issue with tomato juice. I've suffered so much chartreuse on this show. And you shall continue <laughs> <laughs> to, to suffer so much while I make the cocktails. People, amid all of the instructions that I've given you for this episode, please speak. Speak now. You vote with your feet and with your fingers and with your typing about whether we should have tomato tomato juice on this podcast. But anyway, he has gone out for the tomatoes, which are not there. She's going, okay, I'll let you back in. I clearly just saw you walk out and come back in. Of course, on returning to his room with the landlady because he's forgotten his key, poor Margaret is found drowned in the bath. It's a very small bath this one as well mm. it's it sort of beggars belief how a grown more woman like a sink. yeah more of a sink more of a tub <laughs> or a bucket it's crazy really that she's drowned but again no struggle no bruising apart from a small mark above her left elbow the death is recorded as misadventure that's quite the adventure also showing george's dedication to his wives after they've died when the hearse this is a quote when the hearse drew up at the funeral smith told the undertaker i don't want any walking get it over with as quick as you can <laughs> 
after the funeral was over, after his wife was buried, he said, thank goodness that's all over. Mm. Well, he's got places to be. Got places to be, women places to... Places to be. Places women to, to be. hypnotise. Absolutely. Now, things might have carried on in this vein for who knows how long if it were not for the actions of Alice Burnham's father, but also the landlady and landlord of the lodging house where she died. Mm. When news of Margaret Lofty's death, the last one, broke in the newspapers that Christmas, the trio were struck by the similarities between the cases. Good for that them. of Alice Burnham, just one year earlier, and this Margaret Lofty, who had both died in a bath in very mysterious circumstances. They wrote to the Division Detective Inspector of Scotland Yard at the time, Arthur Neal, and urged him to investigate. And investigate Neal does, looking into the deaths of Margaret and Alice and finding there are strange similarities and bizarre circumstances. And it's while he's looking into the cases, he is contacted by one of the coroners who's been asked to give evidence to the Yorkshire Insurance Company for the life insurance payout of Margaret. Now, Neil is feeling that there are enough similarities between these deaths that he has a case to take against the husband. But the husbands in both of these stories have different names. How can he track down the real person? He's been using pseudonyms. Neil tells the coroners, go ahead, hoping to draw the elusive husband out and catch him when he goes to his lawyer's office to claim on the insurance policy. And that's exactly what happens. He watches Mm -hmm. the premises, allegedly, and George Smith turns up. And he's accosted by the detectives and they say, are you John Lloyd? And he goes, yes. He says, are you also George Smith? Oh, and he's like, no, uh, no, no. And then after a while, it's pretty obvious that he's lying. <laughs> he is arrested clever, clever. on suspicion of bigamy and murder. Now, the police, it's then that they decide to bring in the big guns, Bernard Spilsbury, the nice. famed pathologist, to determine what has happened to these women. Mm. Because all of the inquests have found that they've drowned. But yeah. how? And how? And with no signs of a struggle. And how, this is too much of a coincidence. Mm. So Margaret's body is exhumed first and Spills begins his examination. And as he's doing this, news of the brides in the baths murders has begun to spread in the press. Mm. And that's when the police chief of Hearn Bay Constabulary reads the reports. Excellent. And thinks back to the first murder that we now yeah. know was the first murder. He remembers with a chill the strange death of Bessie Mundy a few years earlier. The Kent Police, Kent Police contact Inspector Neal. They exchange photos of George Smith, of you know, Henry Williams, of all of these different pseudonyms. They seek more information on Bethy's death that they can give to Bernard Spilsbury, who's up in Blackpool conducting this investigation. But it remains a perplexing case, no matter how much information they have. On examining Margaret, Spilsbury finds two microscopic marks on her body, but no other bruises. No evidence of heart disease. She appears to have died instantly, which does not indicate drowning. No, indeed. Yeah. He orders a poison test. I was going to say, is there some sort of poison going on there? An injection or something? No. Oh. There's no poison found in her system. Mm-hmm. He even does tests on the bath. They are trying to work out the size of the bath, anything in there that they can find evidence of. He exhumes Alice Burnham's body. The same results are there. No violence instant death and little evidence of drowning. Bessie is the same, the first one, though she has goose pimples on her thigh and apparently that is an indication of drowning. But it's still a bit... "Mm, What's going on? They then do conduct a series of experiments on people as they try and figure out how George Smith could have killed his wives without leaving any evidence. If any of the women had had a fit, there would have been violent spasms. Mm -hmm. They would have moved out of the bath. They wouldn't have been lying there peacefully. There would have been evidence on their body of bruising. In most cases, the women didn't even really fit in the bath. As we said, the baths are quite small. They would have sustained injury. And if Bessie had had a fit with epilepsy, she would have dropped the soap. Yes. Why was she holding on to it? Da, 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 da. So he comes to his conclusion, Bernard Spilsbury, which leads into the experiments, is that George has grabbed the women by the feet and pulled them violently upward. Oh, I see, yes. Now this is going to cause them to slip underwater so fast and the water to flood the nose and the mouth that it knocks you unconscious. It's quite disturbing, but he's literally yanked them upwards, the head's gone back in the water, and it can cause you to lose consciousness. So, uh he... Disturbing and cunning. 
<laughs> Inspector Neil hires a series of experienced female swimmers and divers to test out the various ways that you can drown someone. God, uh, a lot uh, of waivers being signed there, I feel. <laughs> pretty much. You know, there's a line saying, you know, they, they did conclude that trying to drown someone forcibly causes a lot of struggle. Like, what were you doing? <laughs> yes, I imagine it would. Inspector Neil does try the, the feet out under them mm. in the in the tub, but he does that without warning the woman, pulls her under, and she has to be resuscitated, Oof. and it takes 30 minutes to bring her back. Right. And yeah. she just says, I remember water, and that's it, I was out. And it's dangerous. They were like, oh, yeah. God, we may have killed her. <laughs> she's not doing that again. I think she also says, you bastard, for about 10 well, minutes yes, before yes. then giving I, her evidence. I think that's fair. So George Smith, a.k.a. Henry Williams, a.k.a. John Lloyd, a.k.a. Mr. Love, a.k.a. <laughs> Bluebeard of the Bath is sent to trial on the 22nd of June. Smith doesn't give evidence in the trial, but the trial is special as it represented a milestone for the legal system. He's tried for the murder of Bessie only, Mm -hmm. but the prosecution are allowed to use the deaths of Margaret and Alice as evidence of his pattern of crimes. Now, this kind of harks back to our Patreon episode this week, where we're talking about Dr. John Bodkin Adam and trying to Adams and trying to submit evidence of his other suspected crimes into the court on that case it it didn't work mm, yeah. because they were suspected this sets a precedent doesn't it yeah you're able to do that that you can use certain evidence is admissible in court but this is one of the first cases where they go these other things have happened even though he's not accused of them this is a pattern of his crimes because of this probably the jury takes 20 minutes to yeah. find him guilty ah, good. he protested his innocence all the way without actually giving evidence at trial but he is sentenced to death and he was hanged at Maidstone Prison on the 13th of August. And he ended up in the Chamber of Horrors, of course. Of course he did. Absolutely. Subject of numerous films and plays, lots of ones about him. Yeah, absolutely. But one of the theories that persisted was that he was a hypnotist. So I like, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> he was persuading those women to do his bidding. And there was a quote from his barrister, Edward Marshall Hall, who, after he was found guilty and sentenced to hang he said he believed george smith had killed his wives Mm -hmm. there was no way he could say it in court and he said i had a long interview with smith i was convinced he was a hypnotist once i accepted this theory the whole thing was explained but that is the story and the mystery of the brides and the baths murders <laughs> a very very good story there we go i'm not entirely convinced he was a hypnotist i mean probably not probably not i think that's just a very charming charismatic man potentially the theory um, about it is that yes the hypnotism about charming these women to do his bidding and to steal from them and duping them that could happen with anyone yeah. it was the fact that these women were they couldn't explain why these women were so i don't know trance like or just static they had just been drowned without any sign of a struggle and without any drugs in their system mm. how had they done that had he put them in a trance and then held them underwater or tip them upside well, those down things you can't you, you i don't think you can you can't no. hypnotize someone to do something that's going to put them in in their danger the, the, the brain just won't let you do no that. exactly um so yeah, potentially hypnotize him to make him more attractive or to make them suggestible to to steal things for him. Yes, that's a vague possibility. I don't buy it. But to hypnotize them to kill them? No, no, I'm not having that. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and people did say as well that again the soap came back into it that if he had hypnotized Bessie, she would have been in a trance and she would have dropped the soap. I don't mean I'm I'm, I'm not I'm less convinced about the dropping the soap thing because I don't know if there's any chance that well your muscles are gonna gonna clench in Mm -hmm. that situation so you're going to grip Mm. even even harder so i don't know if that's necessarily uh... you don't i don't know i mean i so, don't know maybe there are doctors or surgeons out there who can tell us if that is possible or any of those theories about her holding the soap or dropping the soap are valid or complete <laughs> bollocks of the time but I, I can certainly see that i mean if you're if you're lying in the bath and someone does sort of like pull your feet up <gasps> I mean, that's a terrifying thought. It's I'm horrible. Imagining. I don't know how you get out of that. No. Something that you really can't control. No. You can't leave yourself out or push yourself up. If someone's got your feet up in the air mm. and your, your torso and your, your head are underwater, you're fucked. Well, and the the act of the water rushing mm. into the orifices of the face will knock you out. They, so they said it's I the, think there that's is... more than likely to be the, mm. the method. It's instantaneous death. So mm. they didn't suffer 
away. <laughs> they they didn't have a good life, no, really. Well, yeah, well, indeed. But, uh, but it's it's chilling. The story is that he'd found this method, and and these well, days it would true. it yeah, would I mean, be so easily detectable now, and people yes, would be able absolutely. to to use more forensics to actually find it. You know, it's not a valid method anymore. But, but how he discovered that in the first place? And so determined, you know, through his their whole ex- life experimentation um <laughs> in his <laughs> that we don't know about because it's the sort of thing that you don't just go from i want to do this to final method mm. straight away so there's a period of learning and figuring how these things mm. go sort of thing so i would not be surprised if there were more out there perhaps women who actually escaped or, <laughs> or got away or other victims that or- we do that we don't know about as he was perfecting his his methods all his cases of bigamy beforehand you know they are reported as fact and it's one of those that some people take with a pinch of salt of going you know all these women who he allegedly married and then left abandoned were people making up stories a bit of folklore to try and build up this horrible picture Mm. of him in the past or were there women chancing it and when they saw his picture in the paper going yes he stole all my possessions and he loved me he's not going to say anything about it Mm. but there's enough to suggest that he has been walking around using this alias that he's been identified by several people maybe some of those are false identifications but he definitely was identified in the cases of all these women and it was the police system and thanks to the landlord and lady and one of the victim's fathers who went look look at similarity of these cases using newspaper cuttings and saying you need to look into this because otherwise people weren't talking to each other necessarily well there's no like general national database you can't just put it in and no and sort of search for similar things but they really stepped up to it when it happened and they went no let's investigate this and let's just be be a bit more cunning and just found this real sven garley character and it's thought that he was the inspiration behind lots of books that that sort of copied other kind of um serial bigamists and and murderers as well but he was the inspiration for loads of works of fiction there's a few films about it there's there's other ones about him being a hypnotist as well but it's one of those stories that as soon as you read it you go, why isn't everyone <laughs> talking about this? And yeah, it started in Hearn Bay, his first nice. murder. Da, 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 da. And that's the local history. Well, what do you think, people? What do you think of George Smith or any of the names that he chose? What would be your pseudonym if you're going to commit yourself to a life of crime? Do you have another explanation of what might have happened to the brides mm. in the bath? I think it's fairly clear cut. But yes, do you know the story? Tell us your theories. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us more creepy Svengali type. <laughs> you like that word, don't you? I do. You've saying an awful lot. I do. I saw it and now it's my word of the day. <laughs> day. It's my word of the day. Hypnotist, mesmerist kind yeah. of with a slightly evil twang to it. <laughs> Are there more stories out there of hypnotists killing people? Tell us those. We'd love to hear it. And most important, do mix up a wash house absolutely i mean everyone will have the ingredients for these at home so simple quantities and things out on friday definitely give it a go basil mm. vodka sugar lime easy delicious and delicious and then eat some pesto on the side to treat yourself <laughs> with a big old bowl of pasta or just eat it with a spoon from the jar which is my want sometimes <laughs> not everyone's a savage like you <laughs> no aren't they speaking of savages if you haven't already join us on patreon loads of extra episodes on there and bonus content a wonderful community where we love to chat to everyone and we get into some real debates on there so come and try patreon if you feel like it send us more suggestions of any merch that you would like us to add to the store and the run up to christmas there are links in the bios of all of our social media channels or just drop us a message if you have any questions about the poisonous cabinet thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisonous cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you Bye.